Yeah. So, the word that is drawn out this morning already from the first service as well. You can always trust that God is speaking to us. He's going to reach in and revive our hearts and put our focus in where they should be. So, when we have opportunities to worship, just thank you, worship team. You guys, I really do. <laughs>
to build that bridge of reconciliation so that once again we could be his people. That is an amazing, amazing, astounding truth. Do you see it? Do you see it as truth? Or is it just a, a cute story we tell at this time of year? Is it just songs you hear on the radio in the back? See, I believe this time of year is an invitation for everyone. This season is a season of invitation that I believe God has before us. Whether you're a believer or, or someone who doesn't know Jesus, this is a season of invitation. If you've known God for, for a number of years, for quite a long time, and this is a, a season where He's calling you forward, He's inviting you forward, know me deep. There's more. If you're just trying to decide who this Jesus guy is and you don't know Him, then it's an invitation for you to discover Him as the gift of God. Above all, it's, it's an opportunity, an invitation for us to encounter the living God. Fresh, new. Not, not in traditions past, but in the now. So as we go through the, the weeks to come, we're going to focus each week on one of four figures from the biblical narrative of the coming and birth of Christ. We're going to look through their eyes and their experiences and focus in on the response they had to the news of the birth of Jesus. And so to kind of help focus us and give you a tool, we've got an Advent booklet that I should have received. You can pick more up in the back. And, and all of the wisdom that we have of, uh, when I say we in the next few moments, we is going to be. So let's take it at that. Um, the Advent book looks very, 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 very similar to your bulletin cover. So we're going to try to help change that week high, uh, for next week. But for now, make sure you pick up an Advent book and it is the, looks like this. And it's got places for you to take notes inside. It's got kind of the history of Advent. It's got our heart to uh, move forward in the church in this season. So I want to encourage you to take advantage of this. This is an excellent tool, an excellent opportunity to have as a personal devotion. You can share with your friends in your house, your children. It's great to use in small groups. And so I encourage you, uh, taking that initiative in this season of invitation to press deeper into the Lord. More to it. And so today we're gonna we're gonna kind of launch into this series by focusing in on one of those figures, uh, and that is Joseph, the, the earthly father of Jesus. So if you want to get your Bibles open, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 25. We're going to take these short verses and, uh, and see the, the opening act of the Christmas story. And like with most things, uh, this, is, this is an amazing story. And it starts out with some real, like, I feel like most shows I see on TV, most movies I like, they get you into the plot right away. Sometimes we want to world build and bring in the details and everything else, but uh, the most interesting ones, the most captivating ones, they throw out the characters and they throw out the challenges right away. And so this is exactly what we're going to find, in fact, uh, with this story as we open it. So let's begin in verse uh, 18 and 19. This was how Jesus, God's anointed one, was born. His mother Mary had promised Joseph to be his wife. While she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Her fiancé Joseph was a good man, full of integrity. He didn't want to disgrace her. But when he learned of her pregnancy, he secretly planned to break the engagement. So, right away, interesting story for us. Uh, Mary, a young girl, was probably an arranged marriage to Joseph. This was very common in that culture. Um, and so, when he gets the news, and, I, and this is the astounding part, is it? I just, I would have loved, in a very modern way, to see how he got that news. That, yes, the young girl you promised to, um, yeah, baby. <laughs> I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking Joseph's really shocked. Uh, he's either like, he's thankful. Okay, um, did I get, did he get the news of how this thing came about? Like, I just wonder, did she go up straight up and tell him? Like, oh yeah, uh, angel visited me, this baby's going to be God. Saved the world. Are we still good? <laughs> like, I don't know how that conversation went down. But, but regardless, of, regardless of it, we see that Joseph is a good man. He has integrity, righteousness, and honor. He doesn't want to shame Mary and her family. He doesn't want to get her stoned or killed or kicked out of town. So he says, you know what, let's stop. I'm just 
go about this quietly, discreetly, I'll, I'll divorce you, and it will be done. So we see that uh, God wasn't done with this. Let's move on. Verse 20 to 23. It says this, while he is Joseph, he's still debating with himself about what to do. He fell asleep and had a supernatural dream. An angel from the Lord appeared to him in clear light and said, Joseph, descendant of David, don't hesitate to take Mary into your home as your wife. Because the power of the Holy Spirit has conceived a child in your home, she will give birth to a son. You are to name him Savior, for he is destined to give his life to save his people from their sins. This happened so that the Lord spoke through the prophet would come true. Listen, a virgin will be pregnant, and she will give birth to a son. He will be known as Emmanuel, which means in Hebrew, God became one of us. This is awesome. I mean, Joseph is obsessing over the situation. It's difficult. It's tense. There's no, there's no good out of this. Joseph doesn't, doesn't see a clear way, so he's overthinking it like you guys tend to do. He falls asleep in a tense situation like you guys tend to do. And then he has a supernatural, amazing dream. You know, God speaks to you. He can speak through you. To dreams, to show you things. He can speak through the Bible, the prayer for your friends. Our God is not short of words to say that. So he chooses a dream. He sends an angel to speak to Joseph and say, hey, this isn't an accident. All those promises that I made that you've heard from the prophets, all those years of longing and waiting for the Savior to come, it's happening now. Like, it's, it's going to happen. And you are going to be that protector and father on earth as child. Who will be in his name. This is all done to fulfill one of the greatest prophecies in Isaiah, and that's what he's referencing here. Isaiah 7, 14. It says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Like very likely Joseph had heard these promises. He had heard the, the hopes and the yearnings of his people. And to know that, to see in a certain way of God connecting the dot from then to now that this was going to happen, that God, Emmanuel, was going to come and be with his people. It's amazing. With, in, his, in his frame of reference, I mean, he, he wakes up, yes, and he's going to have two options. Option one, he can wake up and say, wow, I had some spicy food, some bad mushrooms, I don't know what it was. I'm going to divorce Mary and go my way. Or two, he can choose to believe in faith that this is the word of the Lord. That is amazing and fantastic as it could be. This was God speaking into him, showing him that it was an amazing thing about life. So let's move on and see what he chooses. Verse 24. When Joseph woke from his dream, he did all that the angel instructed, the angel of the Lord instructed him. He took Mary to be his wife. They refrained from having sex until she gave birth to her son, whom they named Jesus. This is awesome. This is significant. The promises of, of, of God coming to be with his people. You understand? In the Old Testament, this was the, the greatest honor and the greatest hope that they had. That, that God would come and be with them and dwell with them. And now through Christ he loved. Through Christ, he's the, he is God, the living embodiment of everything we, we know and love about God is going to be there with us. This is all coming to pass. So Joseph, in that moment, he chooses in faith without knowing the whole plan. He chooses to be obedient to the Lord, to follow him wherever he's going to be. And I love this about Joseph because he still doesn't have the whole plan. Like the angel, like, read him a little bit of what's going on. But he still doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. He doesn't know, like we do, the story of how they lay in Bethlehem and there's no room to be in. He doesn't know all these things. So he takes a step forward. He worships the Lord with his obedience and his faith. He takes Mary as his wife. Jesus as his son. And, and from that moment on, I mean, human history has changed. Human history has changed. Faith. And I, I think it's, it's, it's super amazing that God chooses to interact with us this way. I mean, all through the Bible, you see, you see stories of people having to, 
to step out in faith, not knowing necessarily where that next step is, not having all the facts, all the perfect pictures. God calls us to trust in Him. He calls us to have faith and step forward. And, I, and I'm, I'm impressed Joseph did that. I mean, we see that he's a righteous man and he has integrity and he's good. But I believe through his faith, there was something shaped in Joseph's identity that should God had redeemed and redefined what, what good and righteousness meant. And, he, and Joseph really is a model for us, uh, an encouragement for us, as we look to the Lord and look to Scripture, how we have faith in our lives. Because I trust, look, guys, every single one of us walked in here. And we have relationships, we have situations, we have things in front of us that are going to require us to step out in faith. And I believe God is putting those things in your mind. He's giving you a picture to what that is. He's giving you a discernment or impression or a feeling of what that situation is for each and every one of you. And just like with Joseph, he's calling you, trust me. Believe in me. Faith in me. We missed a. I was trying to think, what does this mean for me? There's, there's no, there's no angelic dream that I've had. There's no, there's no seven pound, six ounce baby Jesus waiting for me. I mean, what is it for us? And as I, as I thought on the story, trying to figure out how to translate it to now for you and me, uh, I was reminded of, of my own story of how I came from Alabama. California. It's not a move many people made. And, and, I, and I realized, you know, years back, uh, I was going to a four-year school there called Auburn. They just lost yesterday to football, so let's talk about it. Right Praise now. God. Excuse, excuse, excuse <laughs> me. It's intense back there. Californians have no idea about college rivalries. Probably best to keep it that way. That's why you have mediocre sports. Is that for the Warriors? I just want, I just want to get some... See, now look at, look at you now. I like it. I used to insult your sports teams, and now you're engaged. Awesome. Point is, I was, I was back in Alabama, and, and I, was, I was lost in every sense of the word. I was in a relationship that was unhealthy in every form of fashion. Uh, in school, I was miserable and kind of aimless. And I, and I came to a point where I began to search out what are the other opportunities? What are other things I can do? And, and now looking back, I have the frame of reference to see how God orchestrated and put things in front of me and came down to the past that I had an opportunity to come out to San Francisco to preach today. And I thought, well, that sounds like a great idea. My friends on the other hand thought, well, that's stupid, you don't know anyone. And then my parents thought, well, that's stupid, you don't know anybody, and it's expensive. It's always a thing. I know that. But so there's this challenge. No one was saying, yeah, let's do this. But I couldn't escape. I couldn't escape the, the feeling that yeah, I'm supposed to do this. It didn't make sense logically or practically, but I feel like, yeah, this is something that I might have to do. So I remember kind of obsessing about it, much like Joseph probably was, with the less intensity. And I, and I walked downstairs. I was at my, my dad's house. And, and uh, probably to get something out of the fridge because it's late at night. That's kind of what I do. And, and I see him there, and, and talking about this, this opportunity and uh, he says, you know, son, you should, you should pray about it. You should give it up to the, up to the Lord. And if he says yes, then you should go. And if he says no, then stay and work and save some money. That sounds like sound advice, but you got to understand something like that. I'm a spiritual man. Not, 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 not a real deep relationship with God. But in that moment, when God used my father to give me a good word to Give me a good sense of what I should do next. And so I prayed about it, and, and the feeling didn't change. The, the, the draw to, to move forward to a new season, to take a step of faith and leave Alabama and come to San Francisco was stronger than ever. So I hopped on a plane, two duffel bags, and uh, landed here. And a uh, little cultural difference from, from Deep South to the Tenderloin. Really different cultures. And, uh, and I think maybe in a self-protect mechanism kind of way, I just didn't spend much time looking at it. Um, you might notice I don't talk with much of a southern accent, and it's probably the biggest thing about me that my wife regrets. But uh, 
something, something coming out here, it was a great, it was an adventure. It was a new beginning. It was totally cool. At the same time, it was challenging. It was lonely. And, and I remember I had, a, I had a late night class on, on Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, 7 o'clock was over 8, 39 o'clock. I remember walking literally west down Gary Street. Just seeing, you know, like, you know just feeling in the, in the pit of my stomach just did I make the right choice? Is this, is this crazy? Is this all me? Is this, is this pointless to come out here? Man? I'm just alone. I felt it like deep in my bones to the point I never felt it. Before. I remember in that moment just kind of looking up. I don't know why it's what people do when we get contemplative. You know, about the God who's up. And I did. I walked looking out at the floor. I just, just want to be with you. I just want to hang out with you. If we could hang out in my car for three, that would just be awesome. And I remember in that moment, uh, again, my frame of reference was just a big minimal. I remember in that moment feeling like intangibly, intangibly loved at the same time. And God just gave me a big bear hug and saying, I, I love you. And I like you. Of course I love you. And I knew in that moment that the step of faith I did wasn't I didn't have all the details as to what was coming, but I knew that even in the midst of that challenge, my step of faith had not only taken me across the country, but it taken me closer to God. It taken me closer to His God. So in that moment, my, my belief in Him and my relationship with Him, it was here in this spite. Because after that, I'd be walking to class, and I vividly remember walking up Van Ness towards Washington, and I hear Forrest! See my friends coming up, and nobody approaching me with the sign says, You won the lottery. It was just Forrest! And I'd hear it week after week. And, and, I, and I realized that that's the Lord. It's God speaking to me. It's God calling out to me. And I believe with all the faith in me that was God continuing to call me forward, continuing to to rekindle and stir up my belief in him. My belief in, in the miraculous and the incredible he could do. I mean, and, that, and that's easy to say, looking down the tunnel of time. But still, God was with me. Shortly after, I met some friends in class. And, and this is a big university. My friends were, were from Santa Rosa. They were part of a Christian church. They said, hey, you should come up and hang out with us. He kept saying, there's this girl named Eden. You guys would get along really well, you think. They were right. They get along really well. I had the faith years later to propose. She had the good discernment to say yes. <laughs> and a decade or so later, it's an amazing life. It's a wonderful life, full of blessings. But when I look back, I can see some of God's hand moving here. I can see him putting things in my path, putting opportunities in front of me to, to either say yes and trust you, or no, I'm going to trust myself. I mean, we heard that from the baptism today. That was people taking steps of faith. Trusting in God more than themselves. And guess what? That, that, that in essence, is a... a integral part of our DNA as believers. One step of faith leads to another step of faith. You didn't think that after the first one you were done, right? No, there's more steps of faith, and another step of faith, and another step of faith. But guess what? We can trust and believe that it's not some aimless path. It's actually a very intentional and purposeful path that leads to God's heart in our future. Begins in that moment of faith, in that moment of, of doubt, in that moment of unbelief, in that moment of, of looking at the mystery of what our future and where our lives are. Let me give you some encouragement though. When it comes to mysteries with God, mysteries aren't meaningless. When it comes to the Lord, oftentimes a mystery simply means there's more meaning than we can comprehend. And that's why we have to trust Him. Because our lives simply one step of faith after another. That's, that's what our lives are. 
We won't have the perfect picture. We won't have all the answers. That is why we have to trust. And that's the beautiful part. When, when, when you have the courage to take that step and then take another step, each step draws you closer to God and grows your relationship. And that's how growth happens. Growth doesn't happen in the easy phases of our life. Growth doesn't. Growth happens in the grist and the grind and in the season of challenge. That is how we are growing. And God, I mean, sometimes we're like, Lord, why? Why does it have to be this way? You don't think Joseph was sitting there like, Lord, I love you, but why this way? Why this way? Why in a why the opportunity for shame? And you don't think that that, that marked their reputation their whole life? He did. But Joseph, he kept taking steps forward. The baby came. But Joseph had another dream that said, get out of town. People are coming to kill you. And Joseph took a step of faith. And he was obedient to follow. Later, God told Joseph, hey, now go back home. It's safe. He probably made a life there. How many of you know when you move into a place and you make relationships and you make life, it gets harder to leave? God says, hey, go back home now. Joseph's like, Okay, real estate market, it's up, I'm good, I'm real. But he took a step of faith. Like that's, all, that's, the, that's the story of our life. And with every step, Joseph, with every step of faith that you take towards God, it's an act of worship. It really is. We are lifting, we are lifting our lives, saying, all of me, Lord, direct me, guide me, I love you, I trust. Every step of faith is, is submitting our interests and what we think is right, what we think is prudent. 